Now, I have a privilege to introduce to you the spouse of our next speaker. Callista Gingrich is an amazing leader and servant in her own right. And Callista and Newt, as of today, have now set the new record in Faith and Freedom Coalition. Besides myself and Ralph Reed, Callista and Newt have now spoken and been to more Faith and Freedom Coalition events than anybody else in the country. Yeah. <laughs> Callista and Newt started out attending events going back to our first Faith and Freedom Coalition conference in Washington, D.C. back in the spring, uh, fall of 2010. Now, we had probably about half as many people as we had in this room then. Humble beginnings, but Newt and Callista were there every step of the way. Then they were in the fields of Iowa in the coldest of bitter cold, reaching out to voters, going all the way back to a year ago. And let me tell you, every single candidate and spouse deserve all the credit in the world for putting themselves on the line and for working hard and trudging through the snows of places like Iowa and beyond. It is a, a mammoth undertaking and they deserve our, our, our praise and our credit and our admiration. And even more than that, Callista Gingrich deserves our admiration because she's not only a wife, but she is an amazing host and producer of award-winning documentary films including A City Upon a Hill, Nine Days That Changed the World, Ronald Reagan, Rendezvous with Destiny, and perhaps my favorite, Rediscovering God in America. Please join me in welcoming Callista Gingrich. because we believe America is at a crossroads and care deeply about the future of our country. There are only a few months left before the most important election in our lifetime. Our only opponent is Barack Obama, and we are committed to removing him from the White House. <laughs> Newt is the only candidate with the experience and knowledge necessary to rebuild the America we love. He has a successful national record of creating jobs, balancing the budget, and reforming our government. Today, we need a leader who can clearly articulate why President Obama and his policies are wrong for America. We need a leader with bold solutions to create a better future for all Americans. I believe that leader is my husband. Please welcome former Speaker of the House and the next President of the United States, Newt Gingrich. Thank you all very much. And Clist and I are delighted to be here. I did not know until uh, I heard her introduction that uh, we had been at more of these than anybody except Ralph Reed. But, uh, <laughs> but it comes sort of naturally. We have become a team, each in our own way, trying to communicate some very core principles. And we've done it through books and through movies. And I want to share with you both what we're trying to accomplish. And I want to share with you what I think the core principles are. Now, I, I wore for today, this is a Heritage Foundation tie, which is the Liberty Bell. And I thought it was a good starting point because if you visit Philadelphia, and from here obviously all, all of you have been up there, uh, right across the street from Independence Hall, they now have this exhibit with the Liberty Bell. And when I was a kid, I always assumed that it was called the Liberty Bell because on July 4th, 1776, that it rang out the Declaration of Independence. But that's not true. When it was cast in 1754, 
when nobody expected a revolution. It was called the Liberty Bell because around the top of it, it has a quote from Leviticus, which says, let liberty ring around all the land. And so it's actually the Liberty Bell for a biblical reason. Now I want to start with that because it's a comment on our modern schools that I'll bet you virtually no one is taught in school the origin of Liberty Bell. Because that would require you to explain that it came from the Bible, which would require you to explain that there is a Bible. <laughs> and we live in a period where it's totally politically correct to describe the Koran, which is a sacred book, but not to describe the Bible. Uh, it's just weird. And so we got involved, it really for me, started in 2002 when the Ninth Circuit Court ruled that one nation under God uh, was unconstitutional as part of the Pledge of Allegiance. And I would gotten out of politics and, and uh, left the speakership in 99, and I was actually pretty happy not doing public policy. Uh, but I just thought that their decision was crazy. The how, how could you take Lincoln's phrase, one nation under God comes from, from the Gettysburg Address. Under God is personally written in by Lincoln while sitting on the dais looking out over the first national military cemetery in Gettysburg. How can you take that phrase and suggest it's unconstitutional? And to what degree are our courts becoming engines of secular bigotry on such a scale that they are literally anti-religious. And so I began digging into this, and I produced a little book called Rediscovering God in America, and we later did an edition with Callista's pictures, uh, and it basically takes you around Washington, and then we did a movie that was still doing very, very well called Rediscovering God in America. I came from Atlanta, and Coca-Cola taught me that if you get a brand, you just repeat it maniacally. Um, <laughs> But, but here's the premise of Rediscovering God in America. We take you, we just st stay in Washington. And we take you from the uh, National Archive, where you can physically see the Declaration of Independence, which says, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. And I believe one of our goals as a movement should be to get every state legislature in the country to adopt a law that every child will encounter the Declaration of Independence once a year, every year that they're in school. Because it needs to raise the historical question, gee, what do you think the Founding Fathers meant? We are endowed by our Creator. Well, the ACLU may not like it, but it's a historic fact. And we should have the guts to talk about it. The second thing, of course, is what does it mean unalienable? And of course it means no judge, no president, no bureaucrat can come between you and God. You cannot be alienated from rights God has given you. Which is also, and I'm gonna come back to this later, but we, so we started there, we then take you to the Washington Monument, and then we take you to the Jefferson Memorial, and then to the Lincoln Memorial. And I would say to all of you, if you wanted to truly educate your congregation, Spend a day sometime and walk through with them Lincoln's second law. 702 words, March 1865, four years of civil war, 620,000 dead Americans, more than all of our other wars combined. Lincoln has been radically changed. He started the war as a rational, calm lawyer, he ended the war as a deeply religious man who read the Bible every afternoon. Because he had willed the war. He had said, it is worth 620,000 dead to preserve the Union. And he knew he was the one person who could have ended the war at any moment. So the blood was on his shoulders. And it really did reshape him. There's a terrific small book called Lincoln's Greatest Speech by White, who's a theologian. In 702 words, Lincoln refers to God 14 times and has two quotes in the Bible. I mean, you could give a sermon that was nothing but reading this particular, uh, the most religious inaugural address in American history. And again, you have to say about our modern schools, how would they teach Lincoln? 
How would they explain a man who refers 14 times to God in 700 words? And why do they think he referred to God? Although if you read it, it's pretty clear. Much like Washington, Lincoln believed that he and his country were subordinate to God's will. Totally different than the modern elites. Then you can go to the Jeffrey, to, to, to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the most effective liberal Democrat of the 20th century. On D-Day, when we landed at Normandy, he goes on national radio at 10 o'clock at night. And he leads the nation in prayer for six minutes. It's a prayer again on the Sunday before or after June 6th, well worth your reading to your congregation, or well worth your just playing it, because Roosevelt had this great radio voice. And here you have the greatest liberal Democrat of the 20th century praying for six minutes and closing by saying, people have asked me to call for a day of prayer, but I believe our young men are going to be in danger every day from now to the war's end, so I would like you to join me in making every day a day of prayer. Now imagine that in terms of the current secular group. Imagine how the New York Times and Joe Board would react if a president came on television and actually led the nation in prayer. So we made Rediscovering God in America as a movie. Then we made a movie about Reagan, and we were trying to understand the collapse of the Soviet Empire. So Calista and I went to uh, Gdansk and interviewed uh, Václav Havel. I mean, interviewed Lev Valenza, who was the electrician who became the head of Solidarity and then became president of Poland. And we went to uh, Prague and we interviewed uh, Václav Havel, poet, playwright, three years in prison uh, under the Soviets, becomes the first president of Czechoslovakia. In both places, we asked what we thought would be a Reagan question. We said, what's the decisive moment when the Soviet Empire began to break down? And they both said independently, oh, that's easy. It was June 1979, when Pope John Paul II went back to uh, Poland for a nine-day pilgrimage. This is a year and a half before Reagan's elected. It's a month after Thatcher's been elected. They said it never recovered. Well, plus it's half Polish. And so immediately the idea of doing a film about a Polish pope became one of those major assignments uh, that uh, I decided I was totally for. Um, <laughs> and if you ever get a chance to see a movie, it, here's why it matters to Americans. Now I know this is going to be hard. This is going to take a little imagination. Imagine a dictatorship so anti-religious that it does not allow children to pray in school. And can you imagine a government that would do that? <laughs> imagine a dictatorship that is tearing down crosses. And can you imagine that kind of anti-religious bigotry? It's, I know it's hard for Americans to come to grips with this. And yet what's happened is, because our country is not a dictatorship, we have gradually, slowly, starting with the 1963 school prayer decision, we have gradually accepted the increasing anti-religious bigotry of our government. And we have tolerated things which, had it been a dictatorship, we would have rebelled against. But we said, oh, I guess we don't want to make too much noise. I guess we don't want to be too engaged. So we did this film. And, and I, I was asked this, I, I talked to pastors in Pennsylvania a couple days ago. And one of them said to me, oh, what about the danger that the IRS will come after us? And I said, you know, John Paul II had as his slogan or his phrase at the beginning of his baptism, be not afraid. He didn't say have courage. He said be not afraid. Because if you can shelter beneath the cross, what is it to be afraid of? Now, this is a man who, as a young man, was, didn't think he was going to be a priest. He thought he was going to be an actor. And when the Nazis took over the country, he helped form what was called the Rhapsodic Theater, which would meet in people's living rooms. And they would perform Polish literature. And there was a death penalty for doing this. He then became converted to a belief he should become a priest, and he secretly entered a seminary for which there was a death penalty. If you, if you were said to be a priest and the Nazis discovered you, you were killed. 
When he becomes a priest in 1946, the Nazis have been defeated and replaced by the Soviets, who are waging war against the church. So here is, here is somebody whose entire life from about 17 years of age, or 18 years of age, is spent in the shadow of repression. And yet he says, be not afraid. Here we are, the richest, freest, most open society in history. And would you like to guess how many ministers are afraid? How many are timid? How many, how many would like to tell the truth and said maybe their congregation wouldn't be happy? Or they'd like to tell the truth, but the local newspaper would make fun of them. Or they'd like to tell the truth, but the IRS might show up. To the best of my knowledge, there is no example in American history of the IRS actually moving against the church. None. And yet we are psychologically intimidated by the arrogant secular bigots. And so we made, this, we made these movies. I wrote a book called A Nation Like No Other. We also made a, a movie, A City Upon a Hill, about American exceptionalism. And then Calista decided we, would, we weren't reaching them young enough. And so she wrote a, a little book called Sweet Land of Liberty for four to eight-year-olds, in which Ellis the Elephant introduces four to eight-year-olds to American exceptionalism, because we felt they weren't getting it from their normal schools and their normal literature. So we are really, we've spent now, since 2002, a decade trying to think through how to communicate and arouse and educate the American people. And I just want to leave you with, with a couple quick thoughts. American freedom grew out of a very long period. When the very first English-speaking settlers who were, who were to survive, not counting the lost colony of North Carolina, the very first ones to, to, to last arrived in Virginia. Before they go to Jamestown, they stop at Cape Henry and they erect a cross in order to thank God for having crossed the mountain. This is the first act. We always get told, well, Jamestown was commercial and New England was religious. The first act of the Jamestown colonists is to erect a cross. And there's a model of it still there, current actually on federal property. It's interesting to see where ACU so finds it. The second thing about Jamestown is they went to church 14 times a week. Now, they didn't have baseball and football and basketball. They didn't have, they didn't have television. I mean, they had a fairly limited range of, 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 of uh, options. But their norm was 14. This, remember, this is the commercial colony, not the religious colony. By the 1770s, they have been self-governing for 160 years. And they have a long experience. You elect people to office. They make the laws. They keep taxes low because they're taxpayers. And they came to believe that they had the rights of Englishmen. And in their mind, the British government was taking away pre-existing rights. Remember, the right to bear arms doesn't come from the Constitution. The Second Amendment says, the right to bear arms shall not be infringed upon because you have the right to bear arms from God. Now, why would they think this? Because 237 years ago, two days ago, on the 19th of April, a British army attempted to seize weapons and conquered in Lexington. And this army had successfully defeated Irish, Scots, Welsh, and English peasants. And they got defeated and were driven back to Boston because they faced Americans who were trained and armed. And the founding fathers, <laughs> the founding fathers believed that in the end, if your rights are unalienable, you are the guarantee, not the government, you. And Madison writes in the Federalist Papers. It is the amazing thing that in Europe they are afraid to let people have weapons because they, they, they hate their governments. And in America, we have weapons and government therefore has to be cautious. <laughs> I told Chris, I just saw this factoid this morning. 
there's been a 63% increase in the purchase of weapons since Barack Obama was on. <laughs> Founding fathers would have been pleased. <laughs> I said at the National Rifle Association two weeks ago, we should not only defeat the proposed small arms treaty, which is designed to erode our right to bear arms, but in a Gingrich administration, I would offer a treaty that made the right to bear arms a universal human right for every country in the world, so all people would have the right to protect themselves from predatory governments and from predators. If you had, if everybody who was innocent in Darfur had a weapon, there would be dramatically fewer rapes, dramatically fewer murders, and dramatically less theft. And we have to recognize close with one contrast that I find very troubling. We currently have a president who is simultaneously apologizing to foreign religious fanatics as they kill young Americans, while waging war against the Catholic Church and every right to life organization in America. I was at a Baptist college, Chris and I were at a Louisiana College, uh, which is a Baptist school. And the president, in introducing me, said, if Obamacare is enforced, they will close the schools. This is not purely a Catholic problem. This is a problem of anyone of faith who believes that government does not have the right to impose on you values that are contrary to your religion. Now, I don't mind that the, the administration now has an entire briefing on how to handle the Koran. This is in the defense department. I don't even mind that they say at the end of the briefing, that which others hold sacred, we will treat as sacred. My challenge to the Obama administration is simple. Let's apply in America the same respect for religion that he wants us to apply in Afghanistan. Let's recognize that if the Koran is okay, so is the Bible. If we are going to If we are going to respect freedom of religion for Muslims, who, by the way, do not in Afghanistan accept freedom of religion for anybody else, but if we are expected to understand freedom of religion, then I think we should also advocate genuine freedom of religion. So I would like to see the first church and the first synagogue in Saudi Arabia. I'd like to see the Egyptian government protect Coptic churches. I'd like to see an American government that protests when Christians are being slaughtered. I'd like to see us move against the Iranian government that currently has sentenced a Christian minister to death because he was formerly Muslim and therefore is an apostate. <laughs> and let me give you one last marker for Barack Obama. I don't mind if he thinks it is a good thing for Afghans to pray five times a day. But I think then, in all fairness, he should be for allowing American children to pray once a day. Yeah. Yeah. Let me close by asking our host, John Riddell, to come up and join us. And then I'd like to ask all of you to join John and Callista and me uh, in a word of prayer. I think this is the most powerful way we can end to once again remind ourselves that we are subordinate to God, that we need not be afraid because it is God's will. And our job is to understand and to try to live out God's will. And John, would you lead all of us? And I have been negligent. Before we pray, I am signing the uh, Declaration of Religious Freedom of Conscience, uh, which I think is a very useful reminder that our religious liberty is non-viable and it cannot be violated by the government, and that we as citizens have an obligation to both. Chris and I are going to sign this, and we hope all of you will join us in signing it.